topic, so we'll just have to put sex in every <laughs> title of every seminar. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to welcome you all um, to the seminar on mapping a critical landscape for sexuality in dementia, um, where we'll be exploring current ethical issues, tensions, and debates in dementia studies regarding sexuality. Paper presentations, the three of us will be exploring sexuality and dementia through theoretical and empirical research, including media representations of sexuality and dementia, a new ethic of sexuality that upholds and supports the sexual rights of older adults living in long-term care residential, sorry, long-term residential care settings, and experiences of sexuality and intimacy explored through interviews with couples where one partner is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to uh, introduce all of us, and then um, Elisa will present first, then I'm second, is that right? And then Lynn. So I'll do the introductions, uh, get them out of the way. So Dr. Elisa Grigorovich is a postdoctoral fellow in the Dalalana School of Public Health here at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on the interface of public policy, ethics, and sexuality in long-term care. She's currently exploring how sexual expression is managed in the context of dementia and long-term care. Dr. Lynn Sandberg is a visiting scholar from Sweden. Delighted to have her here. She's an assistant professor and lecturer in gender studies at Stockholm University and Södertorn Uni University College. Her main research focus is gender and sexuality and in intersection with old age and aging. She's currently exploring how gendered subjectivities emerge in relation to dementia and how gender is subverted or sustained in intimate relationships where there is dementia. Um, I am Pia Pontos and I'm a senior scientist at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute University Health Network and I'm also an associate professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health here at U of T. In my program of research, I focus on embodiment, relationality, ethics, and dementia. I'm really committed to transforming um, dementia care such that it's more humanistic and quality enhancing. Um, and to do this, I draw significantly on the arts, both research-based theater um, and participatory arts as novel approaches to fostering a new ethic um, of dementia care. So with that, you take it away. Alright, so thank you all for coming today. Um, so, are there forms of sexuality for which there is no good vocabulary, precisely because the powerful logics that determine how we think about desire, orientation, sexual acts and pleasures do not admit certain modes of sexuality? So inspired by this question posed by Judith Butler and her call to consider what we call those who do not and cannot appear as sexual subjects. In this presentation, I consider the cultural logics that operate in representations of sexuality and dementia. Extending recent critiques of images and narratives of dementia in popular film and in literature, here I focus on mainstream news media. So the media is a powerful source of lay information about health and illness and may be the strongest vehicle for transmitting and popularizing cultural and scientific understanding of dementia. And yet, few gerontological scholars have explored news media portrayals of dementia. And with few exceptions, their analysis has been restricted to the identification of general trends. Previous analysis has shown that dementia is negatively portrayed in ways to reproduce common stereotypes about aging and mental illness and often use hysterical or melodramatic metaphors of epidemics, wars, or biblical apocalypse. Often media coverage is focused on the terminal stage of the illness and emphasizes the loss of past abilities, relationships, and suffering. While these have been important for drawing our attention to the problematic nature of media representation, what is missing from such analyses is a more nuanced understanding of their subjectifying effects or how the media draws in broader cultural narratives that mag to magnify the politics of revulsion and fear that surrounds dementia. There has also been no study of the way in which the deployment of gender and sexual norms in the media forecloses the recognition of life with dementia as a livable life. 
So my analysis is informed by critical scholarship on disability and sexuality, including the work of Judith Butler, Robert McCrure, McGritt Childrick, and Alison Kafer. This, these scholars have shown that sexual and corporeal norms are constructed through the mechanism of objection, or an iterative and performative process of identification and exclusion that both constitutes and reproduces intelligible cultural subjects. So individuals whose bodies, erotic practices, or desires do not conform to the cultural ideal are constructed as abjective beings, and this construction produces and reinforces the constitute outside boundaries of the normative or the ideal sexual subject. The objection of the sexualities of persons with atypical embodiment results from the dominance of the prescriptive standard of bodliness or the cultural idealization of independent and economically productive bodies. <clears throat> Robert McCrure has termed this compulsory able-bodiedness and suggests that this is a system of regulation that intimately intertwined with heteronormativity in that the most successful heterosexual subject is one whose sexuality is not compromised by disability. Sheldrick adds that the intercorporeality of sexual relations heightens the anxiety elicited by the appearance of atypical embodiment, as these types of sexualities cannot be readily recuperated into the norm of the autonomous and self-contained sexuality. So for example, the sexualities of persons with disabilities often do not follow the heteronormative script of dominant and penetrative sexuality. They may be unreproductive, and they're also often public in that they require facilitation by others. Consequently, the sexualities of people with atypical embodiment are always already deviant. In the context of dementia, objection of sexuality is also sustained by the neurobiologization of selfhood, something that's also sometimes called the cerebralization of personhood. This is an ontology of the human that reduces selfhood and personhood to mental capacities of the mind and the biological and chemical processes of the brain. This ontology is reflected in the biomedical model of dementia that attributes the difficulties that persons with dementia experience to brain pathology that is also assumed to erode or destroy their capacities for meaningful self-expression and interaction. Biomedical and other professional care discourse thus largely constructs persons with dementia as non-persons, or as burdensome bodies to be managed by individuals and societies. <coughs> as a consequence, the focus of treatment as care is restricted to the use of environmental and chemical treatment for containment and management of undesirable behaviors. The actions, needs, and movements of persons with dementia are typically discounted as aimless or inappropriate and are seen as disease-driven behavioral symptoms rather than meaningful attempts to communicate preference or to engage with others. So what I'm going to show you today is just a small piece of a larger discursive <coughs> analysis that I did for a paper that is currently under review. I take a critical constructionist approach to media analysis and deconstruct media representations to understand what they signify and for what purpose for public action. To find examples of how sexuality and dementia are presented in the media, I searched both magazines and newspapers um, using an academic database, Factiva, and a popular online search engine, Google News. In my search, I looked for recent examples, so articles published between January 2013 and January 2017, and looking not only at news articles, but also features, editorials, columns, and opinion pieces. I was able to identify three types of media, of dominant media representations. Criminally hypersexual, perversely hypersexual, and sexual <coughs> victims. So in the first type, persons with dementia are constructed as criminally hypersexual. Specifically, they're often constructed as rapists. So on the right are examples of these types of news stories with quotes from the articles on the left. The focus of these stories is on the behavior of the quote-unquote sexual offender, a man with dementia who is accused of having assaulted a woman with dementia, or in some cases a child. Although in some cases the crime has occurred many years prior to the diagnosis of dementia, 
Articles often explicitly link the sexual crime of the person with dementia by citing dementia in the headlines and opening paragraphs of articles. So for example, an article about a 2014 arrest of a US man for committing molestation in 1977, um, the headline of this was, judge dismisses, dismisses child sex abuse charge against priest citing his dementia. Another example um, is a 2015 article about the arrest of, the, of a UK man, and that headline is, serial abuser who carried out more than 200 sexual attacks on boy avoids jail because of his dementia. In that case, dementia was capitalized. In stories focusing on two adults, the primary criterion that's used to determine that the encounter was involuntary rather than essential is the cognitive ability of the woman who's typically described as being globally incapable of sexual volition or assent by virtue of her mental or functional impairment. The voice of the person with dementia is also absent, and instead the sexual encounter is told and interpreted by medical legal experts or by carers. So for example, one news story features a legal expert who's described as a quote, prominent elder law attorney who is brought in to interpret an encounter between two long-term care residents who have dementia, and who is reported in the article as, quote, dismissing any talk of dementia patient consent. Um, another story about two residents reported that, quote, the female resident could not consent to sex because she suffers from dementia. <coughs> in the second type, persons with dementia are again described as being hypersexual or as excessively sexual, and as with the first type, all the stories focus on the sexual lives of men. However, in this type, they're represented as being perverse or mentally ill rather than criminal, and they're not typically reported as being charged with a sexual offense. The focus of the story is instead on the inappropriateness that men with dementia demonstrate by making sexual remarks or sexual overtures towards women who do not have dementia, so for example, a spouse or a stranger. <coughs> So an example of these stories um, is the headline of one story that reports that, quote, hypersexuality is a hushed problem in geriatric care, or that the cultural trope of the dirty old man may actually be an accurate reflection of a man with dementia who is, quote, losing his mind. The perspective of the person with dementia is again missing, and the stories focus on the burden felt by caregivers who are described as suffering shame or anxiety. For example, a half post editorial that was titled The Five Naked Truths About Alzheimer's, Sex, and Your Parents reports that, quote, sexual urges can run hot and bothered long after an Alzheimer's <coughs> diagnosis in ways that can often leave surprise targets simply bothered. Imagine your dad grabbing for your breasts. Further example is a story of a daughter carer who recounts that she was dismayed and distressed by her father's sexuality and then she reports that his, sex, um, that his dementia morphed him from a thoughtful, ethical man into a skirt chaser. So in these stories, persons with dementia sexuality is pathologized or dismissed as a behavioral manifestation or simply a symptom of a neurodegenerative disease process that involves behavioral disinhibition in general. Their sexuality is also judged to be perverse because it's considered to be out of character for older adults demonstrating how the discourse on dementia is intimately intertwined with the discourse on aging in general. Although in this type of representation, men with dementia are recognized as having a sexual <coughs> life, they're denied sexual agency, as their sexuality is linked to their disease rather than to a gentic erotic desire. In the third type, Persons with dementia are represented as vulnerable and asexual sexual abuse victims. This is by only means by which women with dementia and sexuality are linked in the media. So the most common example of this is a news report of a sexual assault in a long-term care home. More recently, news reports have also featured husbands who've been charged with sexual offenses or barred from engaging in sexual activities with their wives who have dementia. So for example, there's now the infamous case of Henry Rands, a politician from Iowa who was charged and acquitted in 2015 of sexually assaulting his wife, Donna Lou. Regardless of the individuals involved, 
All other stories reflect the assumption that women with dementia are essentially asexual, or are not interested in sex by virtue of their medical diagnosis, cognitive capacity, functional dependence, or simply their advanced age. News articles reporting on the sexual victimization of women <coughs> emphasize their vulnerability, characterizing them as children or as being dependent on others. So for example, an article from the Rayans trial stated that the defense lawyer, Joel Yunick, pressed the doctor, asking him, if the testimony that Donna was happy to see Henry, so hugs, smiles, they would hold hands, they talk, would that indicate that she was in fact capable at that point of understanding her, the affection with Henry? And in response, Dr. John Brady answered no, and like in this situation, the instinctive response of a baby that is shown affection by a mother. Other articles on the Rayans trial emphasize the severity of Donna Lou Rayans' cognitive impairment in an attempt to discredit the defense's claim that this was not assault as Donna expressed sexual desire toward her husband. So for example, one story reported that Mrs. Rayan scored a zero on a standard test for Alzheimer's when a score below eight counts as severe impairment. And the quote, staff described her as being in her own little world. So this type of representation of women with dementia is in direct <coughs> contrast to what I've shown you of how men are represented. Again, what is striking is that the voice of the sexual victim is literally and figuratively missing. Almost all of the coverage focuses on experts' opinions on the victim's cognitive capacities, or debates whether consent to sex is even possible, or focuses on describing the inappropriateness of men's sexual desire towards women who have cognitive or physical impairments. So example of these types of headlines included, can someone with dementia consent to sex? Sex and dementia, is it love or assault? Should Alzheimer's patients be allowed to have sex? So these articles, both implicitly and explicitly, link the disability of women with dementia with asexuality by portraying them as both incapable of expressing sexual desire or as lacking such desire altogether. Such representations collapse ethical complexity and context in an effort to construct an unequivocal boundary between good and evil. <coughs> Ultimately, this serves to normalize sexual violence towards women with dementia by locating their vulnerability to violence in their disability, rather than in broader structural conditions and disabling practices. So for example, news articles do not consider how sexual violence towards women with disabilities is supported by their lack of access to knowledge that could support their sexual self-determination. So for example, information about sex, um, their right to refuse unwanted contact, or how to protect themselves or report a sexual crime. It also doesn't mention the provider's lack of training around how to gauge wanted and unwanted sexual expression in the context of disability. So, as I've shown you, news media <coughs> represents the sexual lives of persons with dementia as either unimaginable or as pathological and dangerous. In other words, as the abject. So these representations invoke hegemonic sexual scripts that reduce sexuality to specific sexual acts <coughs> and communicate deeply ingrained assumptions about the nature of embodiment, selfhood, and erotic desire. In focusing on the behavior of men and on heterosexuality, the media reinforces heteronormative masculine norms, which position all men as sexual aggressors and all women as sexual prey. In focusing primarily on the lives of persons with advanced dementia, Dementia is constructed as an all-encompassing and static state of being in the world. And finally, in linking sexuality with cognitive dysfunction and disease, the media reinforces the biomedicalization of dementia and aging and the cultural trope of the loss of self. Such frightening narratives render the sexuality of persons with dementia as both unintelligible and unimaginable, at once excessive and inhuman. In doing so, they deny persons with dementia sexual subjectivity and foreclose their inclusion in our cultural imaginary. Ultimately, such spectacles of sexual suffering contribute to the stickiness of the disgust and fear that surrounds the social discourse on dementia and further legitimize the containment and restrictions 
on the bodies and actions of persons living with this disease. Thank you. So we thought we would hold questions until the very end. Is everyone okay with that? Or do you have a burning question you want to ask, Elisa? Are you okay to... And then we thought we would just open it up to a discussion about all three presentations. Thank you. So um, I'm quite new. Is this blocking your camera there? No. Um, so I'm quite new to the field of sexuality. Um, I conducted a study that involved um, evaluating um, the most recent innovation in arts-based dementia care, which is elder clowning. Um, and so I was in this study interested in exploring the strategies and techniques um, of elder clowns and engaging residents um, living, uh, residents with dementia living in long-term care homes. And so in this study, problematic sexual dynamics emerged between the elder clowns and several of the male participants of my study. The problems were associated with sexualized clown play and the use of passive rather than direct techniques um, to dissuade sexual overtures. These problematic dynamics and the ways in which um, expressed sexual desires were handled by the elder clowns prompted me to reflect on the social denigration of aging and sexuality and the implications of this for the sexual citizenship of residents living with dementia. So all of this culminated in three publications and a blog for Impact Ethics and um, all, this was a collaboration between myself, uh, Elisa, um, a human rights lawyer, and a sociologist who does policy work. And so what I'm gonna present for you today uh, is a brief, brief synthesis um, of this collective work. So affection and intimacy are universal needs that transcend age and disability. Research suggests that sexuality also has positive health outcomes for older people, including an opportunity to experience pleasure and intimacy, decreased pain sensitivity, and increased relaxation. However, there's a long history of sociocultural stereotyping of aged sexuality as being heteronormative, as, as we saw with Elisa's presentation, inhibited, or totally inactive. And this has effectively prevented consideration of the sexual rights of older adults living with dementia across policy, legislation, and clinical guidelines. This is most apparent in long-term residential care settings where multiple barriers to sexual expressions exist. So for example, lack of private space um, and the constant surveillance in long-term care homes. And where healthcare practitioners are often ill-equipped to address the sexual needs of residents. So how to support individual sexual needs and rights has received theoretical attention and scholarship on sexual citizenship and human rights, where the focus has been the removal of barriers to autonomous sexual expression. Yet the autonomy-focused discussion in this scholarship gives rise to an absolutization of rationality and cognition, both of which are impaired with dementia. And so it's our argument that in order to better support the right to sexual expression and dementia, what's needed is a model of citizenship with a human rights ontology that more broadly recognizes the agential status of embodied self-expression and dementia. So we begin by tracing and critiquing scholarship on sexual citizenship and sexual rights highlighting their limitations in supporting the sexual expression of persons with dementia in long-term residential care. And to redress these limitations, we explicate our relational model of citizenship and its foundationalist human rights ontology. And finally, contra biomedical ethics, we advance ethical principles premised on this relational model with our conclusions focusing on the multiscalar implications of this ethic. Sexual citizenship has many features in common with other claims to, to citizenship. It's about enfranchisement, belonging, equity, justice, and rights balanced by responsibilities. 
it emerged as a distinct subfield of citizenship out of concern for the need to broaden the conceptualization of citizenship to accommodate not only class and race, but also gender and sexuality. Scholars have used the concept of sexual citizenship to articulate and support rights claims based on sexual conduct, identity, and relationships. At the same time that sexual citizenship emerged as a subfield, an alternative stream of sexual rights discourse emerged with a different focus. Human rights are premised on fundamental principles such as universality, equality and non-discrimination, security and dignity. These rights are considered to be interdependent, indivisible and inalienable, which implies that each human right is dependent upon the realization of other human rights and that such rights are natural by virtue of being fundamentally human. Sexual rights discourse draws on human rights principles as articulated in international human rights declarations and treaties to argue for the need to globally support access to sexual and reproductive health services, protect individuals from sexual and gender-based violence, and, ch and challenge criminalization of certain sexual acts. In particular, it frames its arguments for actualizing sexual rights claims not with reference to individuals' formal membership in a nation state, i.e. citizenship is a legal status based on nationality that's conferred by a state at birth or through naturalization, but rather re with reference to being human. So that's really a fundamental difference between citizenship and human rights. Collectively, the subfields of sexual citizenship and sexual rights have been pivotal in more fully accommodating rights related to sexuality. However, these efforts have been concentrated primarily on the sexuality and intim intimacy related needs of younger people. Example, ensuring access to reproductive services and access to marriage. Further, the focus on the sexual citizen as a choosing subject capable of self-definition, choice, and autonomy has perhaps inadvertently served to marginalize individuals for whom those dimensions of agency are considered impaired, such as in the case of persons living with dementia. This falls short of capturing how corporeality, including movements, gestures, senses, and sociocultural dispositions of the body is a fundamental source of the capacity for self-expression, interdependence, and reciprocal engagement, which defines human agency. Thus, what's needed is a human rights ontology for citizenship that more broadly recognizes the agential status of embodied self-expression. This ontology underpins our model of relational citizenship. The core tenet of the model is embodied selfhood, which is premised on a pre-reflective notion of agency that resides below the threshold of cognition and facilitates interdependence and reciprocal engagement with the world. It advances a notion of selfhood that considers both the pre-reflective intentionality of the body, so its natural engagement with the world, and the ongoing socio-cultural relationship between the pre-reflective body and the world, so history, culture, power, discourse. It's a perspective that captures the pre-reflective capacity of the body to seize upon and transform the perceptible into something meaningful and the inherent relation, um, the, the inherent relational nature of selfhood. Embodied self-expression must be recognized as fundamental to the human condition and thus supported in and through a matrix of human rights. So our model of relational citizenship is particularly pertinent for supporting the sexual rights of individuals with dementia because it recognizes sexuality as integral to embodied self-expression. Further, with our proposed ontology of human rights underpinning the model of citizenship, sexual rights would be recognized and supported through institutional policies, structures, and practices. In so doing, relational citizenship more inclusively grants sexual rights entitlements to persons living with dementia who have been long marginalized and silenced. Given the significant benefits 
of sexual expression, there has been a call for the development of guidelines and policies to address sexuality in long-term care settings. To this end, reference is typically made to the four moral principles approach of biomedical ethics to guide the conduct of healthcare practitioners in clinical settings. And so these are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. These support the permissibility of intervening in resident sexuality if there is a risk of harm, uh, of harm to self or to others. While these principles offer a framework for sexual ethics for guiding practitioners' practices in long-term care settings, they have not been received without critique. So, for example, the principle of autonomy is typically premised on all, an all-or-nothing global competence. Since dementia is marked by a progressive deterioration in cognition that affects reasoning capacity, persons with dementia fall short of the ideal of the autonomous agent that grounds the principle of respect for autonomy. The current focus on informed consent in medical, legal, and theoretical scholarship on dementia and sexuality thus not only runs the risk of leading us to an autonomy-focused discussion, which gives rise to an absolutization of rationality and cognition, it also reinforces a divide between those who are living with dementia and others. Further, it sets the bar for undue interference significantly high with the application of this principle erring on the side of duty to intervene over freedom of sexual expression. Concerns have also been expressed about supporting autonomy-related rights in relation to privacy, specifically that the physical environment of long-term care homes is not designed with the privacy of residents in mind, so open concept design, open door or no locked door policies, and high-backed chairs rather than having sofas in the lounge areas. Finally, another critique of bioethics is that it leaves unaddressed how the very construction of sexuality in biomedical models of dementia care is pathologized. Sexuality in dementia has been the target of medical intervention through the construction of the classification of inappropriate sexual behavior, or ISB. ISB is a discourse that views all sexual expression and dementia through a lens of pathology and thus deems it subject to biomedical intervention. For example, affection or courtship directed towards a care provider or another resident is assumed to be misdirected and thus pathological or a subtype of ISB. While there has been some critique of this classification, the net of pathology is, is cast so widely in dementia that despite laudable efforts to allow for normal sexual expression, the focus in long-term care remains on managing ISB or supporting the sexuality of people without dementia. We thus argue for the need to draw on ethical principles premised on a different ontology than that underpinning biomedical discourse and biomedical ethics, as that ontology is premised on the loss of selfhood paradigm Instead, we argue for a human rights ontology that valorizes embodied self-expression and relationality. Our embodied relational framework for ethics is premised on the same foundational human rights ontology as a relational model of citizen citizenship. The core tenet of the model of relational citizenship upholds sexuality as fundamental to embodied self-expression. Self-expression is valued for its own sake rather than for instrumental purposes, and is a universal human need regardless of the presence or degree of cognitive impairment. Within this framework, persons with dementia have the right to experience a pleasurable sexuality, which is essential in and of itself. Of course, supporting the right to sexual expression should not be taken to imply that protection from unwanted contact or sexual harm is unnecessary. However, freedom of sexual expression, like all other forms of freedom, should only be restricted in as much as is necessary to protect the health and safety of the individuals involved. Our model of relational citizenship importantly broadens the exclusive goal of sexual ethics based on the biomedical framework from the duty only to protect individuals from harm to the duty also to, also to uphold 
and support their sexual rights in long-term care settings. Supporting sexual rights in this context becomes more than recognizing an identity-based claim to sexual expression, as this often results only in the removal of barriers to autonomous sexual expression. Instead, with this framework, the support of sexual rights encompasses a broader focus on how to mobilize sociocultural and political structures to nurture and facilitate sexuality and individuals' needs for sexual expression and intimacy. This shift from recognition to support is a defining feature of a right, since the enjoyment of rights always depends on social structures through which power, material resources, and meaning are created and circulated. Our embodied relational ethic encompasses both the removal of barriers and the implementation of facilitators using a multi-scalar approach to cultivate sexual expression of persons living with dementia. Supporting sexual expression of persons with dementia will require introducing public health and policy initiatives to raise awareness and to counteract deep-seated perceptions of aged sexuality and dementia that foster discriminatory and marginalizing practices. These initiatives would include redressing prevalent heterosexist and heteronormative assumptions in order to support sexual and gender diversity in long-term care and to challenge homo, lesbo, bi, transphobia. They would also ensure that care staff have a better understanding of diverse residents' experiences and needs regarding intimacy and sexuality and how these can be supported. Organizational practices are also implicated in this ethic. In the context of individual long-term care homes, administrators should identify and correct current oppressive practices, for example, prohibition of cohabitation, prohibition against the use of sexual materials, and staff not knocking before entering residents' private rooms. It also entails the development of clinical and occupational health and safety guidelines in collaboration with formal and informal care partners and persons living with dementia. Fostering an organizational culture that supports sexual expression requires tackling injustice and inequality, not only by implementing anti-oppressive policies and practices, but also by facilitating sexuality, the sexuality of persons living with dementia through the provision of opportunities for sexual self-expression. Examples of facilitation already occurring in some long-term care homes across the world include hosting social events and romantic outings for residents, bringing in sexual advisors such as social workers certified in sexuality and disability to provide residents with sexual counseling, and providing assistance for residents to procure sell, uh, sexual materials and the services of sexual surrogates or other professional sex workers. So our hope is that our model of relational citizenship and the ethic of embodied relational sexuality will be taken up by other scholars equally committed to ensuring that persons living with dementia are entitled to experience freedom from discrimination and have equal opportunities to participate in life, including the pursuit of intimate sexual activities and relations to the fullest extent possible. So thank you very much. Did you hear? I'm sorry, I completely forgot. That's okay. Did, did you hear me? Well, okay. Thank you for the feedback. We must be close enough. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really happy to see so many of you coming for this. It's exciting, but it's also a bit scary because this is actually uh, the first time I'm presenting some of uh, my analysis or my materials. So you have to bear with me that not everything is like thought through exactly, but I'd love to engage in any discussion. And thank you so much, Pia, for arranging this. And it's been really interesting to listen to you because I think that uh, your presentations gives a good sort of background and a good sort of sense of the urgency of the project that I'm currently involved with. 
Uh, I uh, have been working on aging and sexuality uh, before. In my um, doctoral dissertation, I wrote on masculinity, sexuality, and aging. Um, and I came to this project on couples' experiences with Alzheimer's disease and sexuality and intimacy um, a lot be because I felt that although there is uh, increasing an understanding of sexuality as something being part of a healthy aging, as a part of a positive aging, that almost never uh, involved the people living with dementia and their partners. Um, and um, I think Alicia put this very well, but oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, she actually gave a very sort of uh, good background for this. I also wanted to bring out the case of Mr. Henry Ryan, who was brought to public attention as he was prosecuted for sexual abuse after having sex with his wife. Um, he was later not found not guilty, uh, but I think this case points to how sexuality, when living with dementia, often surfaces as a controversial issue, as something potentially problematic, as Alicia has been pointing out very well here. Um, and while sexuality and intimacy, as I was saying, is often discussed as something positive and other later adults, to an increasing extent, of course, there's still discourses as sexuality, of course, but there's still uh, increasing understanding of this as something positive. Um, we, uh, when talking about people with dementia, often hear this in terms of pathology as defined through concepts such as hypersexuality and inappropriate sexual behaviors. Um, and I think that to know something actually about how people with dementia relate to sexuality, the obvious thing would be to actually ask questions to people with dementia and their partners themselves on sex and sexuality. Uh, still, and um, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, knowledge on the experiences of sexuality among people with dementia and their partners are very limited in the research literature at the moment. So in my ongoing research, I just explore the narratives of sexuality and intimacy among couples where one partner is diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I will tell you a bit more about the study in a bit. <coughs> it's currently involving seven heterosexual couples living with mild to moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but just to say something first, um, I want to, and that ties in a bit to PS work as well, I want to sort of stress that um, uh, I think there's a lot to gain. I think Alicia was also pointed that there's a lot to gain actually from bringing in some uh, discussions from feminist work that has been done. Uh, feminists in the 1980s pointed to sort of the pleasure and danger associated with sexuality for women, that women were both uh, subject to assault, but also at the same time that we need to acknowledge the sort of pleasure and joy that women's sexuality can actually be involved in. Uh, and I think that's actually something that could be uh, applied to and tied into uh, discussions of people with dementia as well, that we need to acknowledge uh, vulnerability, as you were pointing to, in terms of how sustainment and undermining uh, or undermining of the sexual self uh, for people with dementia are highly de dependent on others, mm -hmm. that family care staff, policy makers, et cetera, are sort of, you know, really <coughs> important for actually enabling sexuality in people with dementia or not. Uh, but we also need to not just only stay with the potential problems, but also affirm the pleasure, joy, and assurance that sexuality, touch, and intimacy can enable for people with dementia. Um, and just to say a few things about the previous research, we've had some about it here. Um, the majority of research that exists in this area is uh, from the medical field, and the medical literature often focus on the problematic sexual behaviors using terms such as uh, inappropriate sexual behaviors, hypersexuality, as we've been pointed out earlier. And although there's no consensus on what actually counts as inappropriate sexual behaviors, as Alicia was pointing out, it seems to be a lot tied to uh, um, ageist notions of older people's sexuality. Um, but still, it's a very problematically used because it subsumes sexual expressions under a sort of rubric of challenging behavior in dementia in a problematic way. Um, so uh, beside that, there is also the nursing literature, and that, to a great extent, <coughs> actually focuses on how care staff and care workers relate to and handle sexual expressions in care homes, and it's notable to see that this actually don't involve the voices of people with dementia themselves in the care homes, but actually uh, more how the staff sort of deals with these issues. 
Uh, and then there's a minor literature that relates to my own work uh, on the experiences of couple relationships and sexuality and intimacy. And in this work, gender differences are quite clear. Uh, the role of care burden impacts clearly on partners' experiences of desire and sexual satisfaction in general, but it's clear that actually female partners are having more distress from care burden in terms of how they relate to sexuality with their partners with dementia, whereas male partners are more often discussing uh, concerns with consent. And it's also notable to see that negative changes on the relationship in dementia also impacts on sort of uh, sexual relationship in terms of to create the sexual satisfaction. Uh, and a quite recent study by Noguera and colleagues, uh, they actually did a quantitative study where they compared the um, feelings and opinions of spouse and caregivers and people with dementia and a control group of older couples uh, where none had dementia. And they point to how um, Spouse so caregivers are more dissatisfied than people with dementia and couples without dementia. So that's sort of interesting to, to know. But what I'd like to point to is that in this literature there is uh, very, very few uh, voices of uh, people with dementia themselves. Mostly it's the attitudes and experiences of partners that are, are pointed to. Uh, it's also not about these uh, studies are often constant, which is important, of course, for knowing, but we know very little of how the complex meaning making around sexuality uh, is happening in people with dementia and their partners. And it's also notable that in these studies, sexuality is often something quite obscure and is often related to intercourse, but at times it's not even stated what we really uh, understand as sexuality. And for this reason, I'd like to say, just say a few brief things about how I understand sexuality. <coughs> In my study, and as I've been saying, I've been working with sexuality and aging before, so some of my um, uh, understandings of this is sort of something I've been working on, on uh, in my previous work as well. Um, and, um, and in this particular case, the narratives of sexuality that are in focus, how people <coughs> relate to their own sexuality, what I'd like to call sex, their sexual subjectivity, their self. Um, but I do not um, I understand sexuality as denoting activities, practices, desires, and feelings related to the erotic lives of people in the study. Uh, but I don't understand sexuality as something innate or biological, but following a tradition of critical sexuality studies, I'm inspired by uh, the work of philosopher Michel Foucault, who has pointed to as sexuality is made intelligible through discourses, that is, regimes of knowledge. So there are normative dimensions to how sexuality is expressed and experienced. So we're influenced then by, for example, media narratives, popular culture narratives, and not least science. For example, um, narratives coming from sexology, for example, Masters and Johnson's influential part of the sexual script, um, gerontology, and medicine. Um, and I also, this is important of course to me as a gender scholar, I understand sexuality is always informed by discourses on gender and that performances of gender selves are intertwined with the performances of the sexual self. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's, it's interesting for me to discuss gender and sexuality together because I think to the extent that people can uh, express and experience sexuality and dementia, that also ties into how they can experience themselves as, as gendered. Um, but I think that it's also, and that's why I'm using in my project the notions of the Timothy in touch, I think that sexuality actually uh, directs you in specific kind of ways. It makes you think about sexual, I mean, pleasure in a specific kind of way. For that reason, I, I'm using intimacy uh, and touch as a way to broaden understandings of embodiment, pleasure, and desire. So, ex sexuality associates often the direction of intercourse, for, for example, uh, and particular aspects of our erotic lives. So, I want to open up for, and I've been doing this before in my thesis work, the rise of broader square of intimate life um, that are actually on the borderlands of the sexual and the non sexual. So, pleasures and desires are sort of transgressing these very narrow conceptualizations of. of uh, sexuality, I think. And I think also intimacy actually could open up sometimes for going beyond the heteronormative script that point out the image on the media representation. So this is uh, some of the ways I understand sexuality and 
the way I deal with it in my study. Uh, to say something about the study I've conducted, <coughs> mm, it's a qualitative study, and it's been studied with presently, and I perhaps hope to get a few more couples, but I have seven heterosexual couples uh, where one partner is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, so it's five men and two women. Uh, and I've done separate interviews with both the partner and the person with, with Alzheimer's disease. And they were diagnosed between uh, two months to seven years prior to the first interview, so they have mild to moderate stages of dementia. Uh, and they themselves experience uh, some disorientation and memory loss, and some people also uh, say they have some problems with speech impediments. So, um, and this could be important to note, actually, because how people talk about related sexuality and dementia uh, then varies also depending on where they are in their stages of sort of coming to terms with living with Alzheimer's disease. So if you've been diagnosed two months ago, you're in a specific perhaps a crisis situation. I, and I could say something about that as well. Whereas if you've had it for seven years, you've made certain adaptations in your life perhaps. So that's important to note as well. Um, the couples in my study are aged between 55 and, and 86. So it's actually different generations. Uh, and I think that's also, as you will see, something that is quite uh, important to note. All couples were married, and they've been married for an average between 40 to 50 years. Um, and so the aim of my study was to explore experiences of intimate and gender uh, sexual relationships prior to and after the dementia diagnosis. So I was interested then in sexuality, gender, and Alzheimer's disease, and how that sort of, uh, was articulated. Um, so I asked questions on sex and sexuality, intimacy and touch, uh, how they themselves understood sexuality, the meaning of touch and intimacy for themselves. And I was also quite interested in having extensive relationship biography. So I asked them about how they had experienced their relationship prior to Alzheimer's disease, both in terms of sexuality and intimacy, but also, you know, generally their daily lives, how they experienced that. So it's, it's, you know, I got a pretty good idea of how they, they experienced their lives uh, also before Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and just to say a few things, some methodological issues here. It has been quite difficult for me to recruit participants to this project. So what I needed was to actually find people in sort of right stages that were both willing to participate and talk about these kind of sometimes sensitive issues, but they should also be sort of, you know, uh, both partners should be able to participate. Uh, so that was one of the things that, and you could perhaps discuss, like, sort of how that impacts on the production of the study as well. Um, and I also experienced, actually, I'm initially, uh, and I started uh, doing uh, three couple interviews. After, after having done separate interviews, I actually did joint interviews with the couples. But after having done three of those, I felt that in terms of ethics, uh, I felt that the impact this uh, joint interview might have on their relationship was actually potentially harming for them, so I decided not to sort of continue doing that because I felt that there was so much tension in their relationship before, and then having them feel them speak about these issues might actually aggravate things further. So I've stopped doing that right now, and I think that's probably a good uh, decision. Um, so it's it has been some sort of you know methodological and ethical. Uh, difficulties in this project that is important to sort of understand also in terms of you know doing these kind of projects. Um, but just to tell you a bit, and as I was pointing out uh, at the beginning, this uh, is uh, presenting this material is quite new to me, so I will say a few things and there's probably more that's going to come out of it, so I'm hoping you will sort of follow me and keep in contact if you're interested to hear more about the sort of um, results of my study. Um, as I can see for, so far uh, in my analysis, there is a rather great diversity of experiences, despite there are quite a few participants as being a qualitative study. Uh, and there are notable differences both be between and within the couples, where some couples have shared narratives on their intimate and sexual lives, both in the past and in the present. Uh, and they often not, these with shared narratives often did not feel that Alzheimer's disease affected their relationship to any major extent, and that physical intimacy in these cases often still played an important role in their relationships. Uh, but there were also other couples that had more diverting narratives, where the partner in particular experienced Alzheimer's disease as a 
significant shift to the relationship uh, to a much greater extent than the person with dementia. Uh, and so the partner often experiences as the change coming from Alzheimer's disease actually impacting how, how they could be intimate with each other. Um, so uh, this is in line with the previous literature that the spouse has pointed more problems than persons with dementia, although the persons with dementia were often aware of the responsibilities that their partners had to deal with. Um, and there could be a gender issue here as well, actually, that you know, um, many of the women in my study who were partners actually <coughs> narrated lots of also gender inequalities throughout their lives, whereas the men were often sort of you know, saying, we've had a wonderful relationship, period. Whereas the women were like, we've had our ups and downs. I took care of the children for many, many years. So women are actually more prone to articulate gender inequality than men, which I think is not a, something related to dementia, but actually something to uh, how you experience privilege sometimes. Um, <coughs> so I, it actually mattered quite a lot where in the life course the couples were when the Alzheimer's disease entered their lives. Among the couples that were in the 70s and 80s, they understood the changes associated with Alzheimer's disease as not radically different from the experiences of normal aging, and both partners and persons with Alzheimer's disease seem to experience such changes in their sexual intimate relationship was more related to aging, such as decline in sexual desire, changes in erectile function, vaginal dryness, uh, than to, to Alzheimer's disease itself. Uh, however, for the two couples being in their late 50s and early 60s, perhaps more surprisingly, um, these couples, which are sometimes referred to as third ages in gerontology, uh, younger, older, with less experience of care for partner and experiences of illness, uh, and who were also sexually active in terms of intercourse. With them, Alzheimer's disease is understood as more sort of through the lens of psychopathology, and this impacts more on their experiences of what sort of how they can be sexually active with each other uh, in terms of intercourse, but also how they relate to each other, like in terms of touch and physical intimacy in a broader sense. Um, and I also think it's quite important here to uh, note that the relationship biographies uh, are interesting. Um, uh, in an article about Bakey from 2002, she suggests that a good pre-morbid relationship has positive impacts on the relationship in dementia. Uh, and this seemed to be true also for some of my couples in the study. Um, likewise, that unhappy relationships actually made the experience of Alzheimer's disease uh, for the strain in particular for partners. But it wasn't always like that. Women reported, like I said, more gender inequalities and were dissatisfied, but still said that Alzheimer's disease was a big deal and didn't impact that in particular <coughs> physical intimacy. Uh, and it was also different in terms of like some had experience of having had a happy life, and then they said, like, we've had a really happy life, I'm really thankful about what we had. So Alzheimer's <coughs> disease, okay. It's it's not a great thing for our lives, but still, I'm so thankful for the happy relationship we had. Whereas others then said that, since we have this happy life, why does this have to happen to us? Why do you have to sort of experience this when this comes and sort of destroys the happiness in a way? Uh, which is then sort of, you know, different approaches to having had a happy life and a good relationship. Um, and I will now um, bring out a few um, narratives from people, which I'd like to do to sort of point to the diversity. Would it change the song? I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Too many things to think of. Uh, um, so I want to point to that. Actually, um, I think it's important in terms of Alzheimer's disease and I dimension not to think about this in a very binary way as either, either tragedy or living well, but actually pointing the complexity of this. And I think that goes very much also for uh, how to think about sexuality and sexual intimate relationships in um, So, um, for in particular the younger two partners, Anna and Christina, who were in the late 50s and early 60s, Alzheimer's disease is experienced as a major disruption to their relationships. Uh, and this also impacts on their physical intimacy. And for them, it's particularly the combination of increased responsibility and a loss of reciprocity with impacts on their relationships and how they relate to the partners as intimate partners. So as you can see this, in this quote, Christina start out quite early saying, this is not a marriage anymore. 
or I ask for well, what's happened then that makes you say this is not a marriage. <coughs> I take all responsibility, all responsibility. Um, so, and the changes she perceives in her husband and how he cannot no longer engage in the sort of daily activities in their life, that also impacts on how she experiences their sexual and intimate relationship. She can no longer lean on him, she says, for comfort and reassurance. And for this reason, she feels that she pushes him away. Um, and they are engaged in like quite um, brutal fighting, actually. I mean, they both even being physically fighting to each other. So this is like they're having a, a really, really problematic relationship at the moment. Um, so they that can become less and less close, but emotionally and physically after the onset of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so I think that, that Christina's case actually point out quite clearly as well that the sort of gender dimension of this, that she describes how it, their relationship hasn't really been uh, conventionally gendered in the sense that she's been very practical, you know, putting up shelves, doing a lot of things in the home. But she says that she's been very emotionally dependent on him and that he has been able to handle her when she's been angry and immature, as she could say. So, um, but now she feels that she cannot have this kind of emotional dependency anymore on him. Uh, and she now says that she experiences him more as childlike and as a willful kind of teenager. So she attributes a lot of sort of, you know, childishness to her partner, and, uh, which I think relates also to sort of uh, him as being dependent. Then you can also sort of conceptualize this in terms of being a, um, a child. Um, so loss of uh, reciprocity and loss of responsibility and impact on how she can relate to him in intimate ways. And uh, a, sim a bit similar to Christina, Anna, who's in the late 50s, with and her husband Anders being uh, a case of early onset dementia, she describes that her husband as being changed in her from Alzheimer's disease. She's not as She's actually more complex in her narrative or a party. She says, like, he's different, but he's still the same, whereas uh, Christina's actually saying he's an entirely different person. Um, and Anna's actually more committed to the relationship as well, saying that she still loves him, that she still wants to sort of be with him, whereas Christina, she says, I want this to end, sort of. Um, but in a similar way to... Um, to Christina, Anna's um, way of understanding her partner as this different also impacts on her entire sexual orientation, how she experiences herself. Uh, as she puts it here at the beginning, she says, one thing that was very apparent when I first met Anders, I felt so beautiful, and this has been the case all these years, I felt so beautiful, and I was the woman in the world. I was the woman, and Anders was the man. Uh, and she goes on talking about then how now, uh, after the onset, has already cared for her throughout her life course, so her dependence is not experienced as a sort of radical change in their lives. So it's possible to say that rather than a ultimate disease change in their relationship <coughs> and their gender self disability, and early in life has meant a reorientation and trying different paths. So I'm just uh, briefly then mentioning. Um, Another example of how sexuality is not uh, disrupted in Alzheimer's disease is that of Henning and his wife. He's 77 years old uh, and he had uh, Alzheimer's disease for <coughs> seven years. And the machine he says has deprived him of his masculine identity as a professionalist. He can no longer work uh, due to his dementia. But his way of narrating, and he doesn't explicitly relate this to his masculinity, but he says that. His way of, of relating to sexuality and to his wife in the interview um, and how they actually have continued to have sex, sexual in, intercourse, intercourse seem to enable a continuity with his self in the past and sort of an affirmation with the person. He says, like, oh, it's been a really ugly man, so being intimate with women was a way for me to become more confident. And he said, he talks about his wife as being a really sexy lady. So he's actually, you know, um, performing masculinity and sexual subjectivity in the interviews with me, quite similar to men I've interviewed before without Alzheimer's disease. So, um, so for partners to persons with Alzheimer's disease, continuing a sexual relationship with uh, a person with Alzheimer's disease could thus be a way of affirming a gender self who is, um, and for persons themselves to have to sort of affirm their own sort of sexual subjectivity in their um, gender subjectivity in this case, to feel as a man by being able to have continued intercourse. Um, 
I'd like to point out that there, there are clear problems in terms of sort of uh, power and sexuality in this, because I've also made interviews in a different uh, set with only partners where the um, people with dementia were too ill to actually participate. And one of the women in this set of interviews, she actually said that uh, she, con she continued to have sex with her partner because uh, she felt it brought him joy and it, she could see that he was proud to have an erection. So even though she has no sexual desire, she actually um, engages in sex with him to affirm him as a man. So there's a complex lexicon involved in this so sort of whose sexual desires then matters and when living with our family disease. Uh, and then just to wrap up, so that's it. Um, so what you can see so far from my study, the lack of reciprocity in experience of responsibility for partners, uh, and experiencing the partner as a different person and having a feeling of a different relationship shape partners' experiences of sexual desire and experiences of intimacy with partners. And it also impacts on the gender self. Um, whereas the case with Frida and Folke, the couple experienced disability earlier, points to how reorientations to sexuality and disability early in life actually makes also such a big deal for their intimate relationship and that also does not enter as something very strange and different. Uh, and as, a, as I was pointing out at the end here, sexuality and intimacy as a continued performance of a gendered self in dementia could be a positive uh, way of, sort of affirming and sustaining subjectivity. Uh, but then the question is, like, sort of whose sexuality matter? Uh, and I haven't said too much about this, but I think that some of my um, results here point to the sort of need for further feminist engagement in dementia studies as well. And I think that. That's actually something that Alicia also brings out quite nicely about the relevance of critical theories in, in the field of dementia studies. So, yes, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, that was fascinating. I'm aware that some people are actually just slept out, slipped out on their um, lunch break and probably need to get back, but we will open it up for questions for those who can stay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. The floor is open. This is a very interesting presentation and it is really taking us beyond our current thinking and the knowledge base. And I, I feel very hopeful because these, these are the challenges. I, oh, by the way, I work as a consultant for many long-term care homes and we have a lot of uh, situations. Um, from the point of view of uh, relationships, partnerships, uh, sexual partnerships, which are not causing a lot of problem for anyone, to the people who are involved, it's a harmless. Families are on board, and staff feel there is no safety risk and other things. Those relationships go on. But where the problem comes is when the partners who are engaging in this activity do not know how to manage the demands of the relationship. Because when one is not ready, the other one wants to engage in sexual uh, intimacy. Um, or um, there are limits. Because even in, because you've talked about relationship with people with dementia or without dementia, there are demands. And you need to know how to manage the relationship. Um, they are not able to, and the conflict comes. Then there is the ministry expectation, the uh, long-term care inspectors in it, who come in every time they consider this is an incident. Um, and first of all, we don't have a good handle on other behaviors in long-term care homes. We are struggling to manage other complex uh, behaviors. So sexual behaviors comes another, like uh, I shouldn't say behaviors, expressions, sexual expressions brings in another dimension. Uh, it's also difficult when the staff have to manage those relationships. Okay, this person <coughs> is tired now, he needs a break, or you know, then separate them expectations of managing the risk when the relationship does not is not able to continue or that particular in a uh, particular situation uh, brings in many conflicts and problems. But I think we are, um, it's good to look at this because yes, they do have needs. How do we support them? How do we support them in a way that is ben beneficial, 
and not causing any harm to anyone involved. Uh, we struggle with those. Well, thank you. Thanks for your comment. Um, I think that we, uh, the stage that we're at with the with the research is is more thinking theoretically through the issues. Why why is this even conceptualized as a problem? How do we better support this? Um, much more on a theoretical level. So I fully appreciate the challenges that that healthcare practitioners and administrators face. Um, I think this dialogue is absolutely critical if we're actually going to move to finding ways to better support this. Um, I do have a question about, um, if I can ask you a question. Sure. Because there wasn't really a question in there, is that right? It was more a comment? Like what, um, the complexity of yes. these situations because they, because of the cognition, they do not know the, right. uh, you know, having uh, sex in the lounge is, disturbing all the other residents, mm -hmm. other family members who are visiting. They need mm -hmm. to be expressive in the privacy. Leading them or guiding them to privacy is also difficult. Mm -hmm. Monitoring, then the staff are expected to monitor what mm -hmm. happens during that time. Is one hurting other one? One is aggressive towards the other. So there are many, many yeah. dimensions coming to play. Okay, and so, so my, question, so my is, question is, I'm just curious, uh, what is it that has that happens that triggers uh, like that 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 it, it comes to be regarded as an incident? What exactly has to happen? Do, do you follow what I mean? I, I, I first of all, I don't think they are considered should be considered as incidents and made incident reports because yeah. the minute the incident report is made, it triggers ministry inspection mm -hmm. and then <laughs> more regulations uh, because they don't ask the staff; they read whatever is there and talk to whoever is involved and whoever is capable of giving them mm -hmm. a yeah, report. And then there are, uh, so I don't think it should be reported as an incident. Uh, but the, the, there are a lot of, the, when, when there is a, so in the beginning when it is just touching and uh, kissing and sitting together, it's not a problem. But then when, it, when there are demands, one partner, one a resident expects more, and demands more, and the other person is not able to, and it causes distress, then staff are expected to keep monitor mm -hmm. that or police that relationship. Mm -hmm. And put an end to it, then it is going to the a dimension of uh, risk or um, unsatisfaction mm -hmm. or distress to one person. So th the staff responsibility as at the moment with the ratio, staff ratio for residents, like at night time, I, I did a night session yesterday for 54 residents, there are two staff. And night time, there's a lot of intimacy and relationship issues come up too. And for them, they have to do all the other work, plus monitor mm -hmm. and police, things yeah. that don't go well. So the, there are many things, I guess. Uh, first of all, the, um, the, the buildings are vertically built with four people in a room or six people, in, mostly four people in a room. Uh, so there is privacy issues, discomfort of other residents, discomfort mm -hmm. of family members, um, of, the, of the people involved as well as other family members who come regularly and visit. Mm -hmm. So coming back to your question, I don't think I answered your question. Yeah, no, no, I, th I, think, I think you did, I think you did. I think that it, for sure this is very complex yes. and um, certainly we don't support to, to have the answers in terms of what does it actually look like to support this ethic and practice. Um, but I do think it's important that, that, that we as researchers are collaborating with administrators and, and staff and families to, to collectively think this through together. Mm -hmm. We're all bringing different experiences and perspectives to the table. And so um, our hope is that this gets taken up by all of us who I would think should be committed to supporting this yeah. to the greatest extent possible. This, uh, all these three presentations help us to think theoretically, as you said, further than yeah. just at the moment, policing and making sure everybody's yeah. happy 
and when they are not happy, keep them apart and those, you know, that's the level that we are hoping in long-term care for <coughs> now. But thinking through and what is then, um, it's very different the uh, sexuality for the expressions of sexuality for people with dementia. So how do we support it in that context yeah. rather than thinking through from, even from the regular thing, I know relationship uh, challenges in perfectly happy mm -hmm. marriages too. So how do you then extend that mm -hmm. understanding right. and support in those relationships? There are Thank some long-term care uh, staff here, maybe they have something to add. <laughs> do you have anything? To what I said. So we do have an uh, instance that, um, as you described, um, we have one particular case that um, uh, just the touching is mm -hmm. an issue, it had to be reporting touch. Not even, we don't even know if it was really a sexual touch or not, it was just a touching and it had to be reported to the Ministry of Health, and, and now there's this whole investigation and it's like a, an, an enormous uh, dealing that we have to deal with. We have to derive different strategies to deal with the situation at hand mm -hmm. and it's uh, very difficult. Mm -hmm. to deal with. So there should be changes at the policy level, yeah. law, because we are told you yeah. have to protect them and consenting individuals, one yeah. is consenting, one is not. Uh, we had one situation where the spouse was taking her out every lunch time, um, whether she finishes a meal or not, when he, it's his break time, so she had to get up and go with him, he take her to his apartment, bring her back completely bruised. One weekend she even left the house because she felt so unsafe, but completely mm -hmm. cognitively impaired with de advanced dementia. <coughs> but we couldn't protect her because the police did not cooperate, even mm -hmm. after looking at the pictures, yeah. there's harm being done. Mm -hmm. And But one thing is because we did make a noise and the and police then started checking on him when he took her at home. Now she's coming back with our this. Mm -hmm. And he was just, he was telling us, oh, she fell, she, that's why the news happened. But there are no falls in the home when she's at home in the long term care home, she doesn't I call. I think that's yeah. why it just speaks to the importance of this being a multi-scalar yes. uh, approach. Because yes. as yes. you say, it's, it, it can't just be happening you know, in individual yes. homes, and uh, it, it's got to be informed by policy as well. Yes. Celeste, did you have one? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It's just two tiny comments that I can't quite change into questions, so if you don't mind. Um, um, but I thought that the that the FA you're proposing is really exciting, um, particularly with kind of the, the broadness that, that a human rights ontology would offer. And it it strikes me, for example, that the issue of privacy is also a class-based issue, mm -hmm. even within our, our public system, right? Because mm -hmm. a private room is what is a thousand dollars more expensive than a basic accommodation. So who has the privilege of privacy is it I mean it's tackling a fairly basic issue of yeah. how things, how mm -hmm. things work. So that was one thought. Another one was around also supporting gender expression, as we understand it, is very integrally linked with, with sexuality. And I was thinking of a, a case with one of my research participants when I was there. And um, the power of attorney had brought in this group of trans woman breast forms for her to wear. And that, like the brouhaha that ensued about essentially this kind of matter out of place and how this was just not going to happen. So I've been kind of following that the last couple of months, but but fostering an, an understanding theoretically that boards how how integral these things are. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing, and I don't know if it, if it plays so well <laughs> to your last comment, um, but also theoretically finding a way to non-normative expressions of sexuality. Because um, I was listening to a, a CBC radio interview on the weekend, I think it was in BC. Um, and anyway, it was about, it was about you know, someone's, someone's wife had dementia and was going into long-term care and developed this relationship with someone else. Um, but, you know, bruises 
something in someone recognized as cognitively capable does not necessarily equate to harm. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do you, and obviously it's very complex in practice, but how, how to at least theoretically leave space for, for also not pathologizing Anyway, <laughs> I don't really have that was a great comment. Yeah. I, I totally agree that there's like there's this dense complexity and that you can't just um, create any policies or guidelines if you assume that there's a particular form of sexual expression that is normal and okay and then everything else outside of that needs to be stopped. Um, and that requires a lot of education. Because the people who are then tasked with, uh, with supporting sexuality need to have a much more broader understanding of what would be like, um, and not uh, what will be essential and pleasurable and enjoyable for all parties involved. It's important to have this dialogue. Because otherwise, we are going to stay at where we are. Mm -hmm. We need to. And it, it, it will is not only it should be, it is essential to continue in the way we take care of older people in long term people. Mm -hmm. But I also think one of the problems here is to sort of acknowledge uh, that, I mean, in particular for family, I think there's this, this cyber continuity with the, the past of their family members with dementia. But I think, and I think there might just be a great conflict between sort of staff and so we're wanting to acknowledge both the <coughs> past and sort of present expression, first times in terms of sexuality and and, um, and gender expression, for example. But there's a I uh, just recently read an article about a trans woman who started uh, expressing more as a man again when she he uh, then explained, and then everything's sort of tied into your understanding in terms of pathology. But actually, we think about people's expressions of gender and sexuality is sometimes very fluid and open throughout the life, of course. And I mean, in terms of dementia, it's always understood as something to do with the dementia, but actually it could be open in other ways as well. And I think that, uh, I mean, a lot of the dementia studies has been sort of, you know, wanting to, to point to the importance of sustaining personhood. And I mean, this yeah. work is so important, but then I think there's this complexity as well of sort of acknowledging uh, change in people, which mm -hmm. is not to do with dementia, yeah. but actually you change throughout the life. So. And I can fully really understand that that must be a really complex situation mm -hmm. if you're working in, in care as well. And pre-morbid relationship, not only about sexual, in other ways too, uh, in, impacts so much on the decisions the family members make about the resident because now they have the power, power of attorney mm -hmm. and they have the right to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. They don't take it as judicial responsibility <coughs> to make the decisions in the best interest of the person. So, but pre morbid relationship in the broader sense also impacts current. Nicole, Nicole. Yeah. Um, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I too am really interested and excited by your model of relational citizenship. Um, and in thinking in Lynn's presentation, I'm just wondering if this model might kind of transcend place or environment. I'm just what I'm just trying to think about different environments where people choose or are are um, have to end up living. I'm wondering if there's different kind of if the model might have to be in different flavors for lack of a better word, depending mm -hmm. on where someone might be living, whether it's in a home or, or or in some sort of institutional facility. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean I think our model originally focused on long term care mm -hmm. because um, it's the one environment where there is such heightened surveillance and oversight, and that doesn't normally happen to people living with dementia in the community, right? The kind of oversight and surveillance happens within couples and the family rather than within like an institutional authority over it. But we certainly talked mm -hmm. about how the ethic itself transcends the place, mm -hmm. and our desire to bring it to the place is just to show like how much more or how, mm -hmm. how very relevant it is to that space. Yeah, it's an ethic. Right. So it's you know it it, it shouldn't matter where um, where one is one where one resides. Um, I think that uh, you know the importance of activating you know policy uh, organizational um, norms and practices and um, individual perceptions and and attitudes. All of that has to 
be orchestrated in such a way that it's supportive. So the ethic is a principle, really, um, but then how it gets implemented in particular right. settings might be different. The kinds of supports that might be needed m might be different. Right, or the kinds of surveillance. Or, you exactly. Know, family, home versus yeah. family. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One yes. last question. Yeah, um, I was fascinated by three of your presentations, so thank you very much. And I wanted to comment particularly on Pia's presentation because I was interested in the notion of bringing in a, a rights-based ethic, a human mm. rights-based ethic, and I think there can be uh, huge advantages in that, but I also think that you should be careful and look also at the criticisms that have been raised against a rights-based ethics in philosophy because I think mm. that um, you already mentioned some of the critiques on the four principles approach by Vincent yeah. Childress and I think um, one, of the, one of the questions that you need to ask yourself I think is that in order for a right to be uh, a meaningful notion it has to be, um, uh, there also have to be uh, duties. So that if you have, if you say someone has a right, other people have duties to um, to respect that right and to, mm -hmm. to enable that right. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had thought about what are the duties that you think are mm -hmm. uh, fitting to this right that you propose. And I think it's a very complicated yeah. matter to speak in terms of rights and duties in this situation. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, I think it's important because this rights-based ethics is very emancipatory in a way, and I think mm -hmm. you need that. I mean, this, this issue needs that. But on the other hand, I think there are, are some alternatives that you might find interesting. For instance, the capabilities approach by Mr. Monsen as an alternative to rights-based ethics, but I'm also thinking about virtue ethics. Because virtue ethics in, in moral philosophy has been this alternative uh, critique, actually, against the principle or the rights-based ethic. And the virtue ethics looks much more to what attitudes are relevant to um, optimize people's flourishing in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a very interesting question to look into what virtues and what attitudes mm -hmm. are people working with uh, with dementia need or which are relevant to them to enable the flourishing of people as sexual subjects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, just it's so funny that you mentioned that because um, in our writing we actually talk about flourishing. Oh, great. And yeah. so we're yeah. not conceptualizing the yeah. right as, yeah. uh, as something very base, mm -hmm. uh, but something is much more broad. Yeah. And our desire to combine citizenship and human rights comes mm -hmm. from the fact that we want to use the best of both of those um, yeah. approaches together, yeah. which is probably closer well, to the Well, I'm not suggesting idea. that you should skip the whole rights-based language because it has yeah. it has big advantages, but I, I'm just suggesting that you should enrich it with other ethical languages mm -hmm. as well. Right. So, so thank you. That's I'm going to follow up on some of what you've, uh, you've indicated here, but as, as Elisa said, we have turned to the ethic of human flourishing, oh, um, which is just lo like such a beautiful mm. concept yeah, um, and yeah. fits so perfectly given our emphasis yeah. on embodied selfhood, yeah. um, that essentially we're saying this is a capability that yes. must be fully right. supported. Yes. Right. So thank That's you and I'll, I'll look yeah. forward to some uh, further yeah. discussion with you about yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Okay, well thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this officially is the last one of the season, so we hope to see you back in September with our new series of, of uh, lectures, which ha haven't been set in stone yet, but we'll be sending that out.